Hello, everyone. My name is Matilda Davidson, and I am a PhD student uh, at the Center for Intermedial and Multimodal Studies at Linnaeus University in Sweden. As part of my PhD project, I have conducted a qualitative audience reception study, which I am going to present to you here today. I conducted my study during the spring semester of 2023, and thus it is still very much an ongoing project. In this presentation, I will focus on my approach as well as present some preliminary results. And I appreciate any feedback and discussions on how to move forward with my material, especially on how to incorporate my results and combine them with my game analysis. So although I am based in literary studies, my project focuses on video games and more specifically on mediations of animals in relation to climate change and to ecological crisis themes like loss of habitats, loss of biodiversity, extinction, as well as multi-species connections. And this also explains how my project relates to the network of empirical ecocriticism. And with this increased focus on green media or eco media and representations of climate impacts across different media forms, this trend can also be found in video games. And I quote, the gaming industry grosses more income than Hollywood and the music industry combined, making it the most profitable entertainment business in the world. And this quote is from the handbook of eco media um, that came out earlier this year. Animals are commonly represented in video games, but they are most, most often seen as a companion or as a resource or alternatively as part of the background. They are also often anthropomorphized with human speech and movement, or they are made to be cute, round and soft. I wanted to look into how these, represent, these representations influence our perceptions and what alternatives were out there. So I am, I am combining my audience reception study with multimodal case studies, focusing on these two, two games. The first one is called Endling, Extinction is Forever. It is an indie game about a mother fox surviving and taking care of the cubs in a world completely depleted by anthropogenic climate change. And the second one is Stray, about a cat in a post-apocalyptic or futuristic setting where humans are gone. So when I started my PhD, I was quite new to empirical research, since my background is in the humanities rather than social sciences, and thus I took a course in audience reception theory, and I did a pilot study to test out what format would work for me. So I conducted a pilot study during last winter, where I did interviews with participants who were asked to play a short game about bats and how they are affected by deforestation. I decided to focus on qualitative research rather than quantitative, since I wanted to find out personal experiences rather than general statistics, but also because it turned out to be more convenient for a one person project. I knew I wanted to work with the gaming community rather than introducing a game stimulus to potential players. And I wanted to reach people who had played an eco game of their own free will. And I wanted to find out what motivated them to do so. And here I drew inspiration from the idea of attentive listening made popular by among others, get a guard, and it is a practice that is common in feminist studies. So the first game I worked with was Endling Extinction is Forever, um, as I mentioned before. In order to find participants, I reached out to the game developers, and they allowed me to share a link to my study in their official Discord server about the game, and also in the Steam community section. I also reached out to YouTubers who had made Let's Plays, uh, of the game, and I asked them to share my study with their community. But unfortunately, this did not yield sufficient results, and I only received five or six people who should, showed interest um, in participating. And a few of them also stated that they would not feel comfortable to do video interviews, but that they, they would have, be happy to answer some questions in text instead. So after receiving this initial feedback, I had to go back to the drawing board, and I outlined a more general questionnaire to be shared in online forums. So instead of focusing on one specific game, it is based on the player's own experience with specific topics that I was interested in. And this approach did prove to be more fruitful and I received 44 answers over the span of two months. But I also feel like in the process, I lost some of the nuance that was available to achieve with the semi-structured interviews that I had in mind from the beginning. 
And in my survey, I did not really define what I meant by environmental issues or climate crisis, but it was up to the participants to express whatever connotations and games came to their mind. And just mentioning, as a qualitative stud study, I do not strive for the results to be representative of the population as a whole or for a defined specific group, but I instead focus on the qualitative aspects of the player experience of climate crisis themes and animals in gaming. So some statistics. Um, out of the 44 participants, 11 identified as women, 5 as non-binary or agender, and 28 as men. And roughly half the participants, 19 out of 44, were American or Canadian, but there were also um, a broad span of people from different countries participating. And the, their ages varied between 15 and 51, with an average of 26 to 27 years old. So I also asked them if they were concerned about climate change, and only one person responded that they were not concerned at all. Choosing from the possible answers, no, yes, a little, or yes, a lot. Um, I also asked them how much previous experience they had with video games. Uh, and three participants stated that they had only a little previous experience, and the rest stated some or a lot even. So the common denominators of the participants were that they played games regularly and hung out in online forums about gaming, and that they were all, except for this one, at least somewhat concerned about climate change. But other than that, there were no perceived aligning factors within the group. And I did a reflection that since the questionnaire was only available in English, it might not have been accessible for everyone, but also English is the most commonly used language in the gaming communities, communities that I reached out to. There has been some previous empirically based research on uh, the topic of climate change in games. Uh, but they are mostly just focused on serious games or social impact games for didactic purposes. I use the categorization eco games that I find to be broader and also includes commercial releases. Um, so for example, in 2020, Fernandez Caloete et al. published a comprehensive investigation of 64 papers on game-based and gamified in interventions on climate change engagement in order to map the growing field of research on climate change games and play. They concluded that a lot of studies are done with people who are already concerned with climate change uh, through their work or through their education, and they also advocated for studies that would follow the players over a longer period of time and measure the effects, as well as better contextualize the participant profiles. Um, another study that, that I looked into was uh, a framework for climate change engagement through serious games. Um, and they located 15 attributes that they found to be very important um, by combining qualitative interviews and group discussions with players and also a literature review. Um, and some of these um, themes were achievability, that whatever desired action that the game encourages needs to be possible for the players to perform easily outside of the game world. The game should also be challenging, but not too easy and not too difficult. Um, it should be concrete, the message should be integrated into gameplay, it should be clear and concise, it should be credible, the information provided should be trustworthy and sourced, and of course the game should be, should be fun, it should be enjoyable to play. Um, it should provide milestones or goals for the player to strive to fulfill, and it should be meaningful in some way. The game should display a hopeful message. If it's all doom and gloom with no resolution, the player might instead distance himself from it. The game should also be narrative driven, although both the story and the gameplay play an important role and together create the player experience. It should also be reward driven and contain positive re reinforcement, and it should be social in some way. Uh, the gaming environment should be inclusive and also the community should feel safe. And I feel like this uh, framework responded very well with the answers that I got in my questionnaire when I asked um, the players what makes a game fun, according to them. So the three more, most common answers I got were relating to the gaming community, the possibility to be immersed in a game world and games that match the player's level of skill with its level of difficulty. So games that are not too easy, but at the same time not too challenging. I also used um, this model by Abraham and Jamin to, um, 
I used it to identify um, um, how the environment has been used in video games. So they present four different ways um, that can be applicable both to how the environment is presented in video games, but also to how animals are presented in video games. So the first one is environment as backdrop, where the environment has no impact on gameplay. Um, it is just part of the background. The second is environment as resource. Here, the environment or the animal is seen as something to be exploited for play gain. The animal is seen as either substance or amount, not an individual capable of agency. And I also relate this to Val uh, Plumwood's term instrumentalism that similarly describes how the dualism between the dominant, in this case, the human player, and the other, the animal, is justified as means to an end without prescribing agency or any autonomy to the animal. Uh, the third category is environment as antagonist, um, something to fight against, where the animal is seen as a threat that has to be avoided or killed. And the fourth one is environment as text. Um, and this is the category where the player use or interact with the environment or even become the environment. So this approach lets the player change their perspective and explore other stories. And these narratives are not necessarily environmentalists in themselves. They can still be about harming the environment in some way, uh, but the option for different points of view is there. And of course, one game can contain multiple of these models and they can be combined. I use this divide in my questionnaire for a reflection on how nature and animals are used in the respondents' favorite games. So let's move over to some preliminary results. When asked if the participant noticed any difference between playing as a human character and playing as an animal, I got some mixed answers. Some players stated that they felt no difference, while others stated that the controls could be different or that they found it to be harder to connect with the character on screen if it was an animal. Themes like anthropomorphism and the possible consequences that brings to that digital animal representations were also noticed by um, several participants. The issue of stereotypical and limited behaviors, the instrumentalization for human use and anthropomorphism in order to relate for human players were also discussed. Other participants stated that it was indeed a big difference to, in whether the playable character was human or not. One detail that came up was the difference in controls and movement on screen between playing a human and playing a non-human character. And these differences could be seen as both positive and negative by different players. And another common theme when asked about animals in game was um, evoking empathy towards them. Um, design characteristics also played part in answers. Uh, this, of course, varies greatly between different grains. But a common trope that was noticed, as I mentioned before as well, was cuteness and how animal characters are commonly connected to friendlier and lighter games with less dark themes, unless they are char characterized as vile or even monstrous. So in conclusion, the, uh, most of the participants found that animals in games are often represented in very unrealistic ways. They are simplified, they are anthropomorphized, and they are made cute, taking away any potential agency or power from them. But it was also mentioned that this trend was challenged by games like Stray, that takes on a cat's perspective in a somewhat more realistic manner. I also had questions about the broader theme of climate change in games. So I asked the participants if they had played any specific game with a climate crisis theme uh, and what motivations they had for playing that game in the first place. And I think that this yielded some interesting results. Roughly half of the participants, 19 out of 44, answered that they had played a game that in some way dealt with environmental is issues or the climate crisis. But when discussion Discussing motivations for playing this game, few participants stated that they picked up games uh, because of the specific theme. Common motivations were instead recommendations from friends or family, as well as appealing gameplay or just plain curiosity. I think this is an interesting observation for future game research on climate change games, because on the one hand, serious games can be part of educational curriculums and used in teaching. But on the other hand, climate change themes are also part of a broader current media landscape and including environmentally positive behavior and stories in games 
can possibly contribute to a normalization of such behaviors in everyday life for the people who interact with them. The outcome for many players was that they had learned something new from this game, even if that was not the intention they had when they started playing. The participants also had different opinions regarding if a game could or had changed their behavior in the real world. And I have divided their answers into four different subgroups or categories, depending on what kind of change they mentioned. So some answers focused on physical change because of the haptic interaction of gameplay. Uh, and one example I quote is, um, I believe games like Tetris improved my reflex as well. Others stated that they had learned something from games or that they had become more aware of specific topics. Um, quote, a Sessions Creed franchise gave me a different perspective on history and allowed me to explore historical events from different perspectives. And 16 out of 44 participants focused on how games have played part in their own personal development. Quote, some strategy games force you to choose between the short-term and long-term action. You can't just do all short-term or all long-term. You have to juggle them, choosing your priorities by paying attention to the environment. I think this actually improved the way I manage my workload in my real life job. And then finally, others, uh, 13 out of 44, which is roughly one third of the participants, said that they had few or none instances they could think of when they changed their behavior because of games they had played. And I quote, no, although I played a lot of Sonic and Echo the, Echo the Dolphin as a kid, and now I'm, I am extremely anxious about the environment. But even if a participant said no, that does not mean that games haven't influenced their player beha their behavior in some way. It's just that they it hasn't done so in a conscious way that the player recognizes. And self-evaluation questionnaires like this one can, of course, only express how the respondents themselves perceive the topic at hand. And since I work with multimodality and intermediality, I also had a question about media specificity. So. Um, I asked the participants what they found to be the difference between interacting with a digital game or content in another media form, such as a book or a movie. The questions asked about the specific context of learning something. And many participants had strong opinions on their personal preferences, of course, of one over the other. And some argued for the different perks of each medium, depending on the task at hand. The element of play comes up uh, as an obvious perk of the video game medium. No other traditional medium lets the audience take such an interactive and active role in creating the story. Um, but if this interactive or immersive aspect actually is beneficial for learning something about the subject is debated among the participants. The personal connection playing, in, playing an interactive game can create is discussed by some of the participants as an inherently unique feature of video games. And it is thus stated as a reason why video games would have the possibility to affect you more than interacting with other forms of media. Um, so how to move forward. Uh, as part of my PhD project at large, this reception study has added value by including real experiences from the online community of knowledgeable video game players to be supplemented with my multimodal game analysis. As I mentioned before, this study does not strive to be representational, but rather present specific cases and player experiences. Therefore, I can't exactly do a comparative analysis of reported experiences and specific games um, but I still want to uh, incorporate my case study material with my multimodal analysis, and I would love some feedback on how I can do that in a fruitful manner. Um, yes, I'm also not sure what to do, for example, with my multiple choice questions. Thank you so much for listening, and I am looking forward to um, discuss with you.